So it's a real delight to uh, invite up uh, Dr. Audrey Laporte as our next uh, speaker. Dr. Laporte is the director of the Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. Several of us are affiliated uh, with the Institute. She uh, is a professor of health economics. She's also the director of the Canadian Centre of Health Economics and the president of the International Health Economics Association. So it's a huge privilege to have, have you come up and speak. And I really want to thank uh, Rick, who is part of the steering committee, who had, um, had suggested engaging you in this really important area. And we were talking earlier that this builds off some of the discussion yesterday about, about economics uh, of the work uh, here and also the impact that primary care has as well. Okay, super. Well, thank you. It's a real honor um, to be amongst such a distinguished uh, crowd. Um, and, you know, us economists have to be grateful when we get invited anywhere, let's face it. Um, uh, you know, but they don't call it the dismal science for nothing. Um, and, you know, I might disappoint because many people think that when you say economics, there's a dollar sign going to appear somewhere. And okay, right, there might be a, the odd dollar sign floating around in the slides that I've got. But really, economics is a conceptual a discipline, right? So I want to kind of riff. I didn't know exactly what Ivy was going to talk about, but it turns out that uh, the the links are, I think, quite strong uh, between our presentations. So we know that all kinds of things could be highly beneficial to our healthcare system, including greater integration of different kinds of providers in primary care provision. And yet we don't get the uptake it falls on hard, dry, barren soil. And it's frustrating. It must seem very frustrating to say, why can't, you know, we're gonna invest in all the training, we're gonna, you know, prepare people, uh, broaden their skills, and then we toss them out into a system that seems indifferent uh, to those efforts. So I gather yesterday was you know, a description of the tragic and crisis-laden uh, minefield that is healthcare right now. Um, so, you know, we know that um, there's a lot of sexy talk about technologies and AI and whatnot, whatnot in healthcare, and that's all really important. You know, we teach that stuff in our institute. Uh, but at the end of the day, healthcare is a labor-intensive sector and it will remain so for the foreseeable future. And that has implications because uh, the well-known economist, William Baumol, talked about how healthcare is different. Um, it's different in many ways, but in relation to this fact, that labor-intensive industries have slower rates of um, productivity growth. It's rate limited by the fact that it's a people industry you're always going to need a personal support worker, right? And it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one business, if not a two-on-one -on business, okay? So we have to reckon with that. We have to, when we're talking about spending in healthcare, we have to reckon with the fact that human resources constitutes and will continue to constitute a significant portion of expenditure. And we know at the moment that coupled with that, we have a shortage. We've got a shortage in every different direction um, with primary care now, and this is expected to persist because of lags in the ability to train people, right? Can't just snap our fingers uh, and have a highly skilled labor force appear. Um, so there is this now increased pressure to make better use of the people we do have on the ground. And, you know, scope of practice uh, expansions have accelerated. Uh, the, you know, nurse practitioners, uh, at first they could only scan kind of hands and feet and other bits of the body. And now it's the entire body and, you know, writing scripts for pretty much everything now. Um, but again, why haven't we seen the uptake uh, that we would like? And... I'll just say that, um, you know, we also tend to think of um, productivity 
in a different way in health policy than economists think about it. So I'm just going to bore you for a few minutes with a little bit of economic uh, ideas or concepts. So productivity in the kind of barest sense is how much service can a given worker deliver in an hour, okay? Whether it's a doctor, a personal support worker, an NP. Um, and in health policy, there is this tendency to think, okay, right, train you up as an RN, and you have got a fixed level of productivity or skill in you. That is, it's fixed, it's finite, it is what it is. But that's not how economists think about it. Yes, you have what's called human capital or skill as a nurse or nurse practitioner or GP, but that is going to interact with your context. So your productivity and your ability to manifest its full capability is conditioned by your environment. And that turns out to be important when we're talking about teams and trying to think about, well, there isn't a fixed team. You know, we get offered like a smidgen of social worker, a touch of pharmacist, one nurse practitioner, one GP, because there was some study done somewhere and they figured, hey, that worked. So let's roll this out. Or we'll give you four different configurations, pick one. Um, that is not how economists think about, you know, an optimal uh, collection, because what you'd like is for the system to adapt and to configure the team that's required that's best suited to deliver the care to the population that it's serving, okay? So you don't need constant handling and touch point of the decision maker. The system should run and respond in real time. So, you know, how productive an ER doctor is gonna be, just, you know, their training is their training. You put one in an emergency that's got adequate capacity, their ability to see patients there is going to be very different than if you took exactly the same person and put them in some of the emergency departments we are running right now, right? So there's no such thing as a level of productivity. So another um, sort of idea that people think is a low-lying fruit is let's exploit labor. Let's Let's get primary care on the cheap. Uh, you know, this is a theme that says, look, there's unrealized money to be found if you just sub out your, jo your doctors with cheaper people, okay? And that's, you know, so I'm just going to take the example of nurse practitioners, but this, the logic, the logic continues. So, you know, RN for NP, LPN for RN, PSW, okay, you get the idea. So uh, the, the argument is, well, it costs less to train an NP. Therefore, um, they earn less. Therefore, you could save money if you just replace your GPs with your NPs. But unfortunately, that's not how labor economics works. That's not how markets work. Because um, we'll find out that it turns out you're paid based on the value of your labor what economists call the marginal productivity of labor. So you might wish that you can pay somebody less, but that's not how markets work. So we'll just point out that, you know, Canada was actually quite pioneering in the early days, early experiments with NPs. But then it's only been in recent years where we've started to say, hey, you know, this, this is a labor force that really could add value. Um, and this is in stark contrast to the United States and other countries where they've been widely used for many, many years. So then the question becomes, what's up? Um, you know, if you think about a counter case, your dentist, you go to your dentist, you've got hygienists, you've got dental assistants in there, um, and they are sort of integrated into the practice. Right? Nobody ever worries about how they're going to configure their teams. Nobody's instructing the dentist on how to do this. And they've been running like that for a long time. So, uh, you know, some people say, well, we don't have the uptake 
of other types of providers on the part of you know primary care physicians um, because they're powerful and they're resentful and they don't want these people. Um, but that would require that we assume that Canadian dentists are somehow more open-minded than Canadian GPs and that American GPs are more open-minded than Canadian GPs. Well, the truth is that it's the way that the financing is structured in the practice. Dentists can bill for the services provided by others in their practice. So they configure the practice as required to serve the population and they bill for those. So it's true that nurse practitioners have a lot of value to offer, but if you, in many cases, if a, you know, a, a physician is running their practice and they were to, on their own, hire an NP, the salary or the payment for the services rendered by that person would come out of their salary. Okay, I've just lost my little cute thing. So again, you know, um, this is the idea that we're just going to graduate these folks and it's going to be cheap. We're going to get them, we're going to train them shorter time, release them into the system, and we're going to save big, big bucks. But as, as I said, this is a red herring because that's not how economics works. The wage is driven by the marginal productivity of labor. So some of you will be saying, well, I don't know how long this woman was trained, you know, in university, but I don't think she's worth, you know, whatever they're paying her at the University of Toronto. Um, I could have been marinating for twice as long. That's irrelevant. Okay, what matters is what's the value of what of the knowledge and the skill and the service that's being rendered to society. You know, if that wasn't true, then we'd have to pay uh, the GPs that trained at uh, expensive American school uh, more than an equally skilled uh, Canadian G GP that uh, trained at a less expensive Canadian med school. Okay, that's not how it works. Cost of training enters into the picture in terms of the supply, right? If the, if the cost is too high and people say relative to what I expect to earn, I'm going to go somewhere else. And if the supply of that provider goes down too much, the wage will go up. If you increase the supply of them, the wage will go down. So I'll just talk about an example. So does that mean, you know, we don't want to use nurse practitioners? No, that's not what it means. It means that you have to have an understanding of the conditions under which it makes sense, where there's opportunity to gain from substitution or complementary practice. So um, there is a distinction between NPs and GPs, right? There's a set of services that they can both provide and some that you do need the extra training and the nature of the training that a physician gets in, in medical school to be able to treat. Um, and you know, the early literature, which came out of the nursing literature, had suggested about 90% of what a GP could do, an NP can do. Um, but over time that has settled into around 60 to 70%. So, you know, and we talked about uh, in, in Ivy's talk, uh, presentation, she talked about something very important, which was knowledge dissemination amongst the health professions of what each other can do, what their productivity is. So that's very important. So it takes time to get a sense of, is it 60, is it 65, 70, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but from an economics point of view, what matters is relative productivity. So there are things that they both can do. And one might think, oh, well, if one can do everything better, you know, faster or whatever, then th that person should do everything. But again, that's not um, how it works. We're going to go back to this, if you don't believe me, about the you're paid based on the value of your labor. I'll just hearken back to, um, you know, nurse practitioner wages and the trend in them over time. Uh, you know, we're national here, so uh, I just pulled a figure from a little bit further back, BC 2009, 
NPs on average were earning about 120, and GPs were grossing about 250. Um, median salary in Ontario right uh, in 2022 is about 130. Okay, it's you know there's some variation depending on experience and all this kind of thing, but about 60% of a GP's gross goes to running the office, the lease, the, the equipment, the receptionist, the materials, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and you know, if you take that into account, then your GP salary is actually the take home is closer to something like 150. Um, and that's uh, extra for performing services that an NP uh, doesn't provide. Um, so it just reinforces the idea that you're going to have to pay nurse practitioners the value of their labor. You know, you can argue about whether that's adequate now but it's still going to be relative to what a GP gets and uh, it should be so, right? Now, again, that doesn't mean we are not, there's no opportunity to substitute. It means that the gains to substitution are not to be found in looking at the salary. And that's why you get impediments where people think, well, there's no gain because look, I have to pay this one, this and that one, that. So there's no point. Um, which is wrong, because what matters again is comparative advantage, another concept uh, from economics. Um, and so this is, relates to when people say this, they probably don't know that this is what they mean, but they argue that increased use of nurse practitioners frees the GP to work on stuff, you know, that you have know, more complex cases, if you will, or uh, things that are outside the scope of practice of the nurse practitioner. Um, but we could even see comparative advantage working in a case where, let's say there was overlap, 100% overlap in what they can do, or very close, uh, but there's differences in terms of um, productivity in doing those things. So I'm gonna give you, I'm kinda of, kind of close with this, a example to illustrate my point that I can stack this in the favor of the GP. I'm going to say that the GP can do both things better than the NP in the sense of faster. Okay. And this is quality adjusted. So don't get into that. Um, and I'm going to say that the doctor can see um, more complex patients in an hour and more less complex patients in an hour than the NP. Okay, so let's say in this example that it takes the nurse practitioner an hour to see one complex case and seven and a half minutes to see a less complex case. So in that hour, they either <clears throat> see one complex person or eight less complex people. Okay, um, and I say, well, let's assume the GP can see two people in an hour, two complex cases in an hour, it takes them only 30 minutes. And they're even better at seeing the less complex cases as well. They only take five minutes to do it. Um, so they can get 12 done in an hour. So the GP can perform, as I say here, either twice as many complex cases as the NP or 50% more or less complex cases. And I've set this up so that the GP has what we call an absolute advantage. They just do everything faster, okay? So you might think, well, this is a case where, you know, nurse practitioner is out of luck, okay? But what matters in economics is comparative advantage or relative opportunity cost. And uh, let's look at the different allocation of people uh, in this situation. So uh, if the physician performs the complex case, uh, it takes them 30 minutes or her 30 minutes to do it. And in that time, they could have seen six less complex cases. So the sacrifice or the opportunity cost of them having focused on the complex case was the six less complex ones. The nurse practitioner um, takes an hour to perform 
the one complex case. And in that time, they could have seen eight less complex cases. So the opportunity cost of the, um, of the nurse practitioner focusing on the complex case is eight lost less complex cases. So what if instead we said to the GP, don't worry about the complex case. You focus on the less complex ones because you're better, you, you know, you do that better than the nurse practitioner as well. So the doctor does that, does that case in 40 minutes. And, um, you know, in that time, if in the deals with the less complex cases, and in that time, they could have seen one in a third complex cases, very complex ones. Um, and so the opportunity cost of the nurse practitioner focusing on the less complex case was one really sick person, but for the doctor doing that, it's one in a third complex cases. So in other words, the GP has a comparative advantage in providing the complex case, treating those people, and the nurse practitioner has a comparative advantage in the production of less complex cases. Meaning the stuff I have to sacrifice instead of doing this, right? That's what we care about as economists. It's not just the dollar, the face value of how much is it, th this and that. It's the fact that I chose this, what had to be sacrificed. That's part of the cost. So as I say, I'm kind of closing in on here. So let's say you got a waiting room. And in the waiting room, you got one complex patient sitting in there. You've got more than 12 of the less complex one. And there's a practice that's got a GP and an NP. And they're sitting there trying to think about how to tackle this room of people. They know they've got to treat the complex case, OK? So there's two possibilities. They let the NP treat the complex case. If the person does that, they're going to take up the entire hour and no, no less complex people will be seen by that person. But the GP could devote the entire hour and treat all 12 of them, okay? So as a practice, in that next hour, they've dealt with complex, they've dealt with 12 less complex, you know, it's almost Bob's your uncle, you're good. But what if we switched it up and we said, uh, you know, let's let the physician uh, take a half hour, because they can see two complex cases in an hour, so half an hour to treat the complex, highly complex, and the rest of the hour treating six less complex, and let the NP, who is now not treating the complex case, focus on the less complex cases, in which point, uh, case they can produce, uh, treat eight of them. So the practice now has treated one complex case and 14 additional people, right? And so I haven't added bodies here, okay? I haven't spent, you know, more in the sense of the human resource on the ground there, but we've increased the efficiency, right? So that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to send signals that incentivize providers who have the best knowledge of the, what we call the production function of care. What mix is best suited to yield the best outcomes for the population they serve to make the decisions about this? So at first blush, one might look at it and say, okay, right, how exactly are we head uh, Laporte? You, you know, I still have one GP, one NP, um, but it's the cost per visit that's going down, okay? And the scope of practice changes that we're making, and I've done quite a bit of work now with the Ontario Ministry of Health on looking at the returns to these policy changes, and I think it's important to see policy as an instrument of yielding value to the system if it's done well. Um, and the results suggest that there are very significant returns, uh, both to the healthcare system and the public in terms of improved health of, of doing these. And in fact, each and every one of them that's been done going way back into the mid 2000s. Um, but there's gonna be limited uptake unless 
Uh, that is to say, people choosing these professions, uh, unless they are compensated for the value of their labor. And this is going to be, doesn't matter who is going to provide it, okay? Whether it's a doctor, NP, RN, it's the value of the service that you're going to have to pay for. And, you know, we know, we've understood the team's good thing, potential there for these kinds of efficiencies that I've just illustrated here. But you've got to break down the incentive barrier to allow for their incorporation. And it's not providers being nasty. It's that the signals are coming from the system. When you prioritize fees, you pay a certain way, you are signaling to the actors in the system what the priorities are from the perspective of the system. So they direct themselves to those rewards because that's the mechanism by which you interface with them. So in other words, you know, we're the masters of our own fate here. So we need to, as many of you have talked about, focus on the outcome of the practice and leave the configuration where possible to the practitioner, either the GP or an NP that's running their own practice or whatnot. And so I'll just close by saying, uh, perhaps in defense of my profession, um, that economists don't think in terms of costs. That's an accounting way of thinking about the world. Accountants uh, think about, you know, year end and budgets because they have to, bless their hearts. Um, but economists do not look at healthcare spending as a cost. We view it as an investment. And that forces an analysis of any costs uh, in light of the benefits they yield today and into the future. So in terms of primary care spending, we don't want to get into the vortex of fixating on who is earning what and is this too high or is it too low, because that's meaningless, independent of what return is yielded from that spending in the form of things like reduced ER visits, right? Or the additional health that's been preserved or even created as a consequence of the presence of primary care. And I'm not even gonna talk about broader economic returns to the labor market and broader society, okay? Just to the healthcare system itself. And this, uh, you know, means that we should really be thinking in terms of return on investment. When you bring in a policy change, Every dollar that you spend on it, what does it yield back to the public system and in terms of uh, improved public health? And this also requires that we not shy away from equity because once you think in these terms, then you have to recognize that the greatest capacity to benefit is to be found amongst those who are in the poorest health. And so the greatest returns are often to be found in those communities. And if that's taken seriously, then that in and of itself, um, you know, with a recognition of an equity piece there, um, can be used to guide resources in a way that can uh, alleviate some of the gaps that we see even in our universal system. And with that, I'll, I'll end and uh, we can do a thing like Ivy did if you want to talk amongst yourselves, uh, or we can open it up to the floor more broadly. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Audrey. That was uh, fantastic and, and also uh, 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 will stimulate a lot of conversation about relative roles and values and, and, and all of that in this crowd for sure. Um, I wanted to ask, um, you know, governments typically have looked at healthcare expenditures for the last 30 years or 40 years as something they need to keep the lid on, right? Um, and that, that um, kind of sense still pervades the, the cost rather than the investment. So just really interested in your views, and, and I, I want to talk to you later as well about, you know, return on investment in primary care, and we've talked about that before, and I'd like to follow up on that. But um, 
in your experience, what does change political views about thinking about investments? You know, we've got more than 6 million Canadians now. We're headed for 10 million Canadians with no primary care. The system is going to be a total disaster when that happens. The system's already a disaster. It's going to get worse. Um, and we've got all this privatization, you know, uh, uh, Walmart, uh, Amazon, everybody's uh, pharmacies, everybody's getting into this business and capturing data and setting up clinics and all that. Um, how do we convince governments uh, of the uh, idea of investing in a sector that actually can, uh, uh, in this sector, it's actually the only sector that can really address the quadruple aim or quintuple aim, you know, effectively within that sector? Um, how just if you have ideas, <laughs> this yeah. conference is really kind of about what actions can we take, and if you have ideas or suggestions just based on the work that you've been doing with government about how do they move, how do we move them even a little bit from keeping the lid on to making smart investments? Yeah, that's that's uh, you know a million dollar question, or now with inflation probably more than that, but uh, it's more you know that's the whole point is that you know that's kind of a personal fight is when when you say you're an economist they think cost effectiveness analysis, and I you know and that's very important, but that's not looking at an investment framework. And health is an investment. It yields, as you all know, I don't have to tell you, uh, all these returns to society at large. Now, your health system uh, planners in the ministry have their hands full, as it is. Many of you are living at the coal face there and making these very, very difficult decisions with you know, all kinds of information absent. Um, so they're not even thinking about the other returns. They, they can only focus on their portfolio. So when I'm working with them it's really pushing this investment thing and at the end of the day you have to be able to show that they got value back and i'll tell you what i can't you know i'm still doing the work for the nurse practitioners and the pharmacists and we're kind of working our way through professions here um, but to show them that that policy itself can be an innovation and to show them that these tools actually can work because Believe it or not, these healthcare providers are very intelligent people and they can respond to incentives um, and they will read whatever you've written and react to it. Um, so I try to show them through the evidence, but it's been a, it is a very difficult um, slog because the arguments always degenerate into, you know, this profession is the bad guy, they're earning too much, you know, that one's, you know, getting this, or, you know, the nurses are just not as committed as they should be, you know, to the environment, you know, on and on and on it goes. Um, and so it is, it's not an easy one, but I just keep, you know, sticking with it. Uh, because if we don't recognize that that's what the healthcare system is doing, its job is to buffer, you know, and be there in cases of economic downturn, right? That's why it's there. So you don't, right, you don't lose everything. Um, that you can bounce back and there are massive returns. Um, I'm not sure how successful I've been uh, because I find the conversations still are going in ways that are unproductive and unhelpful to get us out of this. So, you know, many of you have more insight about how to navigate these shoals, um, but all I can do is, you know, try to speak as an economist and hope that there's something useful in what I have to say. Yeah, thanks, Audrey. Uh, Sabrina Wong. Um, so you, you, you mentioned something in your talk, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and you said that you should leave the kind of composition to the clinics to organize amongst themselves. And I wondered if there were any tools that we could um, invent or provide to clinics to help them along their journey uh, to really get to the right kind of composition. Um, because I do think that practice is personal and people want to do specific things and you know that kind of thing and then how do you show practices return on investment for yeah. the practice yeah and you know these are excellent questions so it's part of what ivy was talking about is you train people up you right and then the practices have to know who can do what what's their skill what's the scope and this is we're in an evolving environment right now so that's going to be very important anything that can uh, communicate to providers what's available to be to be uh, sought or integrated. The other thing is once they figure that out, 
they have to, it has to make sense for them to actually incorporate these providers, right? And we tend to think of, oh, doctor wants to boss people around. But you can imagine a nurse practitioner having their self independent practice, they should also be able to hire the complement that they need. Um, so there's communication of that, aligning what you want in economics is what's called incentive compatibility. What's the social objective? And then feed that back to make sure it's aligning with everyone else that has a stake in that outcome. And so you have to think about what does the practitioner face and don't resort to saying they're nasty doctors that are too powerful. You gotta say, wait a minute, if they're behaving this way, what's causing it? If you don't have people going into that field, what's causing it? And uh, you know, so I think changing the financial incentives is key, communicating the value of teams. And then when we talk about another important point that you raised and you know, several very important points in there is uh, what does the provider get out of creating value to the system? Not very much, right? And you could think about a world in which a practice yields big improvements, serves an underserved community, generates a lot of extra health, that transits into a lot of savings to the system, right? What share do they get of that? Big fat zero. So there's possibilities there that if they knew how they were doing, and if they performed at a certain level relative to others, that they might get a share of the value proposition that they created. There's nothing wrong with, with that because it's their effort and ingenuity that has yielded those value, th that return. So I think the kind of dashboards, performance, feeding it back is one thing, but telling me how I did and then, you know, it brings me diddly squat in terms of return is not going to move anything, right? You, they have to be part of the, actively part of the solution and be compensated for their, their intellectual um, investment. Just one more. <laughs> so, so thanks, Audrey. That was great. Um, in your discussion, you were talking about you know insurance rules and the limits that we have on. We've had a lot of discussion here, mostly about you know government funding for fixed teams. Like that's been a lot of the discussion, not about changing the rules of engagement on allowing teams to figure out their own skill mix. Do you have any thoughts from an economics perspective on the likelihood of success and resilience of systems built either on like a public fixed mix model or one that's on changing the funding rules to allow more kind of local uh, adaptation? Well, you know, that the equivalent of that is saying, you know, how much confidence do I have in the Goss plan, which was under the Soviet regime? Okay, where they had to figure out every screw and how much it should be sold for. Um, that's not what we should be doing, right? I think this has been said by many people in, you know, policy analysts and so on, that it's the outcome that we want to pay for. I don't care how you get there. I don't need to know that, you know. The, the professionals are on the ground in a community. They know what the needs are. And our job is to make sure that they are adequately compensated for the skills that are going to be required to yield, you know, care at the appropriate level of quality and so on to that population. So I do not have any confidence in the fixed model because it would require that you get it exactly right. And it might be right at that instant in time for a practice, but then what happens when the population ages underneath it? Then that fixed structure may not fit even in the one it used to fit in. And that's not where government should be acting. It should be setting the rules of the game and allowing the professionals to play within that framework and, you know, uh, measure the outcome. And that's where all this data analytics and feedback is going to be so critical and might actually allow us to go to another level because that's been a real impediment, right, to, to progress. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Ajay.